it's really strange because uh, once the ball is hiked, everything seems to leave your mind and then you just do what you're supposed to do and it just seems to come naturally. I think, you know, pro football is a, uh, a beautiful, uh, dirty, wonderful, cold, cruel game. And the reason I say it uh, like that because I think this is an opportunity for players, uh, you know, to make great contacts on the outside, uh, have an opportunity to open many doors for them in business, they have an opportunity to make big salaries playing pro football. But on the other hand, you're really nothing but a commodity. And as a commodity, uh, you're easily transferable from uh, one place to another just by the transfer of a contract. It's like most anything else. When you find out that you know what you're doing, it, uh, it becomes a great deal of fun, and that's the way the game of football uh, was intended to be. Franco Harris entered the world of professional football in 1972 with very basic expectations. By the end of his first season, he had shed the label of rookie and became a premier running back and the Pied Piper of Pittsburgh. You know, like it's very strange uh, saying that as you get into the huddle and then you tend to concentrate on what the quarterback is calling. And you break the huddle and like you line up. And uh, if it's your play called, you know, you'd like, be wondering, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, is the line going to make the right block? You know, is the quarterback going to get the ball? And is he going to hand the ball off to you? Well, you know, is there going to be a hole there? And uh, we have a little running room. Once you have the ball, you know, uh, all the sound and, you know, like all the sights around you just seems to fade out. You know, it's a beautiful feeling being in the open field, you know, you bust through the line and you're in the open or you catch a pass and you're in the secondary, you know. Uh, Right at this point, this is when you really start to think goal line. Usually, you know, when you're in the open field, this is the time when, uh, like, all of a sudden, you know, there's that one big raw. At age 33, Nick Bonacanti has labored 12 years as a linebacker. Only in the last three has he been able to experience winning. I think, you know, a, a ball player who plays pro football, really, uh, I've been 12 years now, this is my 12th year, really has to have some satisfying, you know, factors to look back at. And no question my my you know, with mine is, uh, uh, after playing Dallas in the, uh, the 72 Super Bowl and getting trounced by them, I felt that uh, you know, just having been to the Super Bowl was a lot of fun, but after reflecting in the offseason as a loser, 
as a loser in the, in the uh, Super Bowl, I knew one thing that, you know, unless you're a winner in a Super Bowl, you're absolutely nothing because uh, there's only two things that happen. I think there's a winner in a Super Bowl and there's a loser in a Super Bowl. Uh, working right up to the Super Bowl, I think everybody's even. Uh, you have the two teams getting the same publicity. The two teams are recognized exactly the same. But then there comes the game, and then after that ball game, there's only one winner and one loser. And then the winner is the one who gets all the accolades, gets all the honors, gets all the awards. Everything happens good for him. But then there's the loser, and that loser, I believe in my own mind, is put below the worst team in the NFL. I remember at that time, uh, uh, Buffalo had a 1-13 record, and I felt that the Dolphins were put below the Buffalo Bills. And we had that whole offseason to reflect upon being a loser in a Super Bowl. And then from that time on, we, you know, all I thought about was just, you know, not only getting to the Super Bowl, but winning the Super Bowl. I remember what I think it was Cornell Green said, he was with the Dallas Cowboys after, you know, we got beat in the Super Bowl. He said the thing that separated the Dolphins from the Cowboys that particular day was that the Dolphins, all he thought about was getting to the Super Bowl, and the Cowboys not only thought about getting to the Super Bowl, but winning the Super Bowl. So that following year, you know, I, that kept going through my mind, and the first day that Sheila talked to us in, in the uh, training camp, he talked about was winning the Super Bowl, not only getting to it, but winning it. And I'll tell you, there's, I think there's one sad thing that I think that goes through my mind as a ball player, and that is the fact that there isn't an opportunity for every ball player who plays in the NFL to get to the Super Bowl. Because unless you get to the Super Bowl, and unless you get to the big game, the game that means everything money-wise and, and award-wise and recognition-wise, I think you, you've, you've spent a lot of years in the NFL not really tasting uh, real satisfaction. I'll tell you, until I got to the Super Bowl and until I won it, knowing what winning was all about, I really didn't know what satisfaction was. And uh, I think that has to be the epitome of satisfaction. Football has experienced many changes since John Brody made his professional debut 17 years ago. Now at the culmination of his career as a quarterback, he can best reflect on the game. Uh, there are certain areas that look at us as a commodity, a piece of meat. Uh, you know, management uh, varies a whole lot about it. I think uh, many of them think very highly as foot, uh, of football players as a, as a group or they would look at us all as individuals. But uh, when we're out there, I, I'm sure that the crowds look at, uh, look at football players as uh, a machine, you know, uh, rather than a group of 40 individuals. Uh, and the one thing that I think it's important for players to understand is that they all are uh, beings, you know, and it gets tested out there pretty well. And to be able to maintain uh, yourself as a being, uh, as one develops as an athlete, he's often looked upon as a, as a commodity by certain areas. And I think it, uh, it helps one develop himself and understand a little better what he is and what his priorities are in life. And uh, it's definitely going to affect everyone. Uh, being in the National Football League for a period of time because it's a wonderful place to take a look at, at who you are and it, you, can, you get the feeling sometimes as if you're in a fishbowl. I certainly uh, wouldn't go out there and play for nothing anymore. Uh, it is my business. And to some degree, you have to, you know, you get paid according to what you produce. And I'd hate to think that, uh, you know, if uh, I wasn't getting paid anything, I certainly wouldn't put the, the effort and, and probably wouldn't have the same interest, and nor would I have the same involvement in it. So. 
it probably wouldn't be any f as much fun anymore either because you know it's it's just kind of a, a devotion of all your efforts into this one purpose and it's it's your job and there can be a whole lot of satisfaction in your job i mean uh, i don't consider it work i consider it involvement and something that i really enjoy doing and i'm lucky that way but i i think that i would definitely show up very seldom uh, and only then for games if I wasn't getting paid. See, it's our business. This is how we make our livelihood. But I don't think anybody in their right mind would, would step on a football field and, and take the abuse that he takes and take the physical punishment that he takes and take the injuries and take the blood and, and the sweat and really and, and, and the tears if you want to go, and go into it uh, just for the, for the sake of making dollars. I think there has something uh, else has to go into it. And this is the really want to play the game, really to have something deep down inside you say, I love football, I want to play football, I really enjoy playing football. Because you just can't do it for dollars. You can't be motivated enough to go out and take all the emotional and physical strain of a Sunday afternoon strictly for dollars. It's just not worth it. Somebody said, you know, like to be a football player, you know, I guess it's that thing where still you have to act like a little kid you know like you still have to have some of that children's play in you Here I was in elementary school, I wanted to play football, but my mom wouldn't give me permission. So uh, here I go to my father and, uh, you know, look, I explained to him that I want to play football. And, you know, him having that sense of athletic also, you know, signed the paper for me. But that was real funny, you know, when I look back, because when, when my brother was a freshman in high school, and a sophomore in high school, my mom wouldn't let him play football. She just said it was too violent and that she thought that uh, he would get hurt. So he couldn't play. You have so many things to think about that the physical contact part, sure, they're much bigger, but uh, if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you don't, uh, it, it all hurts the same depending on how they hit you. That really isn't the, the part that a quarterback pays mu much attention to, is the, is the physical part. You have to be able to take a lick. But, uh, and if you can't, you won't play long. I think injuries are a part of the game. I think, you know, are freely accepted by the uh, players who play in the game. Uh, I can honestly say, you know, now to reflect back in the 12 years I've been in the league, that I never think about injuries. I never think about getting hurt. Uh, I never think that when I go on a football field, I'm going to be injured. Uh, I never think to protect myself on a field.
there's something different between you know, hurt and injured. You know, like you know, like when you're hurt, you know, uh, you know, like I think it's something you know that you know, you know, like like you can play with, and it's uh, something you know to be expected. But uh, you know, when somebody really tries to injure you and uh, puts you at the ball game, you know, like that's what I, uh, you know, really call it very very cheap. Fortunately, I don't think we have too much of that. I never heard anybody, you know, say I'm going to try and go out and, and put this guy off for the season. I hate this guy. I'm going to try and rack his knee up. I've never heard anything like that. I think this is a figment of the writer's imagination. I think it's a figment of the public's imagination that uh, the ball players are trying to go out and maim each other. One thing that the, the public has to keep in mind is the fact that uh, we respect uh, the other player across the line because we know he's doing one thing. He's trying to earn a living. <laughs> We know that he has a family. We know that this is the way he's making his dollars right now. So by trying, you know, by trying to intentionally hurt him, we're really taking a guy's livelihood away. So I think there is more of a, uh, a fraternity that says, no, we're not going to take cheap shots at a, a guy on a field. We're not going to take cheap shots at a back who is already on the ground. We're not going to take cheap shots at a quarterback who is who is down on the ground. <laughs> I think when a ball player gets hurt, I think it's from a, most times a legitimate hit, a violent hit. It could be a forearm, but it's a, a forearm and, and a cause of action. I think if you have a rash of little injuries, uh, it might be a sprained toe, or it might be a bruised thigh, or it might be a, a uh, cut on a hand, or, or like this, a cut on your elbow that you get from the uh, poly turf. Uh, one thing that, that you do get inside of you, you just get so tired of getting these little nitpicking injuries that if you get one more little nitpicking injury, you're just about ready to go through the wall. And it's not a knee injury, it's not a major injury, it's just these little things that just nag you and nag you and nag you. You know, like you have many funny moments. And uh, one just happened to me recently, you know, uh, with uh, 30 seconds to go, you know that you only have one more play, you know, and and like I was hoping that, uh, you know, like the ref wouldn't let us run that play at all, but he said run one more play. So, uh, you know, uh, here I was thinking, you know, wow, maybe it should be a quarterback sneak and he could just fall down, you know. So like the ref came back to the huddle and he said, run one play and cover yourself up. You know, so right away I knew, you know, watch out, because I last played a game, you know, people tend to do a lot of strange things. So we went in the huddle, and, you know, I was just saying to myself, quarterback sneak, fall on the ball, and he called my number. <laughs> I think people have the illusion uh, in a huddle that uh, everything that goes on in the huddle is, is really technical, that everybody is is having a lot of inputs. The defensive backs are telling you, well, I like this coverage. The defense linemen are saying, well, I like this uh, linemen and linebackers are saying, this is what I like to be lined up in. Well, it really doesn't happen that way. Uh, all that's happening usually in, in the course of a game is uh, everybody's so tired and, and winded and uh, uh, you're in a, for a drive like we're playing in Kansas City. Uh, I was so tired in the first quarter, this was two years ago, that I could barely catch my breath. So all I did is, you know, I get the signal from the sideline to give the defense and we get in the huddle, and I'm like this, I'm in <gasps> zone, <gasps> zone, over zone. And that's it. The huddle's broken, and we can go up to the line. And that's the extent of uh, what a huddle is really like. You know, the funny thing is, the big mystery in football is what goes on in a huddle. And if, there, if you could be a mouse in some tackle's shoulder pads for about uh, five plays, you would, no long, you would walk off the field in disinterest. Because it's really kind of, you know, things such as uh, don't step on my shoes, uh, don't spit on my knee. Uh, there's really very little that goes on. And, and a lot of the great plays that have happened that have been related to uh, great thought have come out some like uh, in Minnesota, the score is 10 to 7 one year. And we're third down and two yards to go on their two-yard line. We haven't won a title before. It's the biggest play we've ever had, the biggest single play. I went to call a play. Force Blue is up talking to the referee, uh, counting the house or something, I don't know. Uh, Cunningham and Willard are in the background having a fight. Uh, Dick Witcher's telling Ted Qualick that if he doesn't quit giving us that Penn State cheer, 
he's going to knock him on his fanny, and we don't have time to even call a play. And finally, Woody Peoples is standing there and said, just get up the line and run the ball over me. And we did, and we scored. And after the game, they said, how did you think of that? You haven't called a quarterback sneak in 12 years of playing pro football. And I said, oh, well, you know, it, was, it just looked like the thing to do. Oh, you know, there's things that happen on the, on the football field all the time. Uh, I'm lying down Sunday with uh, Forrest Blue, and I'm on my fanny, and the ball goes over somebody's head, and Forrest says, Oh, Christ. Well, he says that, and I said, Well, I can't throw it from my... And uh, Kaz looks over to me and says, I wish you wouldn't talk like that. He says, We'll protect you much better if you just cut all that junk out. I said, Forrest, I was answering... I mean, I, Kaz, I'm answering Forrest. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, oh, I just wish you wouldn't say that stuff. Well, oh, you know, it, it, that's all. You know, I don't print that. <laughs> 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 You know, I think if, if there's one area where athletes uh, rebel or, or are reluctant to answer, it's in, it's in areas where people relate to certain people. Uh, the winner is good and the loser is bad. And I don't think athletes ever related to that, basically. I think they relate to the fact that both teams are real good, especially on a professional level, and they can never understand a fan not understanding that is that, hey, both these teams are comprised of 40 outstanding football players. And so there's a winner and a loser, but it doesn't mean that one is good and the other is bad. And I think most of them, you know, understand throughout the league with one another that, hey, one of us is going to get beat. And it doesn't make us bad. It's kind of uh, the other end. It's, it kind of ties with our whole society is that if you're not the winner, you're bad or you're wrong. And I think uh, the players in large, uh, the makeup of the players in this league are guys who are comprised of a whole bunch of winners. And there was one guy who wins it all, but the others are also winners.